have lived close to the Gulf Coast all my life. That oil spill, it's sort of set things back a while. And what we do, we build pipe spools for all the oil and the gas refineries uh, inland and offshore. Our job went from 44 hours a week down to just about nothing. Just live day by day. We never know when the, when the next day ain't gonna be there, you know. So you can't take it with you when you go. So just enjoy it. Nothing could be a better experience than to have grown up here on Mobile Bay. Those favorite memories you have of going to bed late at night with the waves still bobbing you up and down, burned to a crisp sunshine, and just knowing that, you know, the next day was going to be full of the same. Oh, we got the biggest one! That is a big jellyfish. Oh, we put a little I grew up in Mobile and spent, just like my mother, every single summer of my life in water. I'm Casey Calloway. I'm the executive director and baykeeper for Mobile Baykeeper. The mission essentially is providing citizens the means to protect the beauty, health, and heritage of the Mobile Bay watershed, Alabama's waterways, and coastal communities. Friday morning, the news stories were all, it's capped, it's fine, but still, it took a while for any of us to really understand that that oil disaster was, was our oil disaster, or could be. Nothing has ever happened in this country of such a magnitude. So it just didn't, it defied understanding for a very long time. You know, all the waters were shut down, all the fishing was shut down. So a lot of people that make their, their living out there, they, they didn't have nothing coming in. People feared not only that this was a loss of a season, but a loss of a lifetime. Fishing isn't just something people pick up and do. It's something that your granddaddy did and your grandmama does. The year following the Deepwater Horizon accident, you know, was a terrible year economically. The media claims that we've dodged a bullet here with what's happened in the Gulf. In some cases, what we're seeing is a complete return as if nothing happened. The truth of the matter is that beach systems are very dynamic and ecologically they're also very dynamic. So walking from the swash zone, which is where the waves are breaking up and down the beach, up to the upper beach, you're, you've walked through two or three kind of unique ecological zones. And so, you know, it's a little premature, I think, to say that, you know, ecologically this will have no effect. My background is in geophysics and environmental science. When the Deepwater Horizon event occurred, uh, it was natural for me to be attracted to it. And in particular, I was very much interested in what was going to happen to the beaches. All right. Basically what we found was that when the oil came up out of the well and got to the surface of the ocean and started to cross the ocean, it was weathering and it was losing these light molecular weight compounds. And then when it got here, some of this oil got buried and that weathering process stopped. After a year, the samples that we collected the day the oil showed up on the beaches and the samples we collected a year later were essentially the same. The part of that hasn't been told is when all of this happened, we were the first ones on the docks after the first suicide of this disaster, which was the boat captain who committed suicide in June. We realized that this is hitting a little bit harder than we anticipated. And so that's when Project Rebound came about. Project Rebound is funded by a $12 million grant from BP to the State Mental Health Department. So we have 20 counselors in Baldwin County and Mobile County who go and do group counseling sessions, individual counseling sessions to those who have been impacted by the oil spill. The strongest people that could handle anything that were considered the most resilient people broke. Resiliency is a word that's used a lot of times. I personally just know a lot of people that it has impacted. They've, they've lost their vehicles, they've lost houses, they've lost land. The economy is still not back up there and I don't, and they don't expect to ever get what they had back. You know, you lay up awake at night and you 
you just worry about it, you know. Who can I pay this week? And, you know, can I put this one off and pay it later? You know, we talk about the fact that we were already in an economic recession. So you take that and you couple it with the largest environmental disaster in history, and you've got the most powerful punch that's going to knock your legs out in front of you. And that's basically what happened. I've had a lot of heart problems. Uh, I've had two heart attacks since, since the, uh, the spill and three stents since then. And, uh, you know, who's to say it, it is or not, but the doctors do, do say that uh, stress is one of the key factors in having a heart attack and, uh, you know, heart problems and, and stuff. And with, with all of this that, that's happened since the oil spill, and even as of today, it's, it's still a stress. Sometimes when you say you're resilient, it can, it can make people angry because they're like, I'm so tired of hearing that I'm supposed to be resilient. I, we're supposed to be this resilient community. Well, I guess I'm not as resilient as I thought I was. And so it makes you question yourself. It, makes, it, it made people that never have known how to ask for food or go to a food pantry forced to go, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you go to a food pantry? There's a lot of anger. You know, um, when you have a, a disaster that where you can actually blame someone, there's anger. You can point a finger and say, you did this. It's not like a natural disaster. It's not a, an act of God. My name is Laurie Bosarge, and I live in Codin, Alabama, South Mobile County. This is wood that we would put on our windows for hurricanes. As I was painting it, it, it uh, I would just cry. The clinic that I had up here at UAB is a clinic uh, called the Environmental Medicine Clinic and we have all kinds of people there, people who have occupation related diseases, uh, perhaps people who are out fishing in the Gulf, shrimp fishermen for example. Uh, we have people who had uh, dermal exposure to oil, uh, that skin exposures to oil, and we have people who are con concerned about long-term impact. The sad thing is a lot of these people work in the fishing industry or have spouses that work in the fishing industry and they are so scared to step up and say anything because, you know, they're fishing. <laughs> Core exit is the oil dispersant that was used uh, in this Gulf oil spill and, and some of it impacted the people who were in fishing boats in that area. Winds can carry core exit uh, landwards and inwards. The impact of core exit was greater than we realized. I told my doctor, I said, I've never been in the water. And he said, you didn't have to. You know, it's in the environment, it's in our lungs. I try to keep it covered all the time, all the time, because it's just not safe. I went down to the state docks, which is in Balabatry, and took photos of the containers that had the correction and I actually got sprayed by uh, from the wind coming off I got sprayed by one of their their you know guns. I began to see these people in my clinic uh, they showed up with, sometimes with physical complaints so we've studied Corexit effect on human lung cells but not its effect directly on human beings. We're also looking at Corexit's effect on the respiratory organ systems of humans on land, crabs as vertebrate aquatic animals that go back and forth from land to the water, and then fish in the water, which are invertebrates in the water. So across the spectrum, uh, we are examining these effects. So on the human lung cells, when we study that, uh, we've noticed that there are changes in the permeability of the cells that line the breathing tubes, our airways, uh, and, and that causes some edema, some swelling. We really don't know the impacts over the long haul of what this could mean to the environment, the land, the water, and human health. When I'm gone and my kids are my age, I would love them to be able to walk down this beach and see the same things that I can see, a croaker, and that I saw before June 2010. I'd like them to have some confidence that, you know, 
the odds of this happening again are, are lower. There are other oil spills that have been studied where ecological consequences that were unexpected occurred. There's no reason to think that we're immune from that. Now, it may turn out, and I hope it turns out to be true, that we did dodge a bullet at, at those lower scales as well. But we really do not have enough information to say anything about that right now. That's one of the things that most of the other country doesn't see, because when you see the tourism is just, it's rocking, it's just, it's doing so well. But we're not over it yet. We still have people that have thoughts of suicide and hopelessness, and Baldwin County has the highest suicide rate in the entire state. And we don't know if that's associated with what's going on, but you know, it's something that we have to look at. We need the community to continue to pay attention to it. And by the community, I don't mean Mobile or Baldwin County or even just Alabama. We need the nation to keep their eyes on this because if we don't change, what we had happen in April of 2010 can happen anywhere else and can happen over and over again. We might have dodged a bullet, but it's still a, a loaded gun out there in that gulf.